is an assistant professor with fish and wildlife and conservation biology in fish and wildlife conservation biology at Colorado State University. He's the principal investigator of Aero Eco Lab, and I suspect we're going to learn a little bit more about Aero Eco Lab tonight. Uh, this lab is a, is organized is uh, focused on um, monitoring aerial migration of birds and other critters. He's also a core partner in BirdCast, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology migration forecasting tool. I suspect many of you use that, and it's getting about time to start uh, checking that BirdCast regularly. Dr. Horton was educated, uh, began his education at uh, earning a Bachelor of Science in Biology at Canisius College in Buffalo, New York. He earned his Master's in Wildlife Ecology at the University of Denver, uh, Delaware, and his PhD in Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at the University of Oklahoma, one of the more prestigious uh, programs in ornithology. So tonight, Dr. Horton is going to share with us um, some of the research he's been doing and some of the discoveries they're making using remote sensing tools like radar to monitor uh, migration of birds, insects, and other flying critters. And all I need now is to get out of this. Thanks a bunch, Chuck, for the uh, the introduction. I really appreciate it. All right. Yeah. And I need to... Oops, what happened? Um, ah, I am not sharing. You should be able to share it. And uh, thumbs up, you can see things on your end. Yes. Cool. Awesome. Well, thanks everyone for coming out. Um, appreciate it. Um, yeah, so as was mentioned, uh, I'll sort of give you an overview of some of the work that we've been doing on migratory birds. Um, I came and gave a talk maybe three years ago. So I pulled up my presentation from three years ago. Um, and I didn't want to um, be repetitive. So I tried adding in a bunch of our newer stuff, you know, that has more or less occurred, um, you know, probably in between the last time I came and chatted with your group. So I really, you know, love coming and chatting with this group. I love the, the background that everyone has and interest in birds. Um, so hopefully the stuff that we're working on will be just as exciting uh, and youthful as as was mentioned, right? As as these migratory birds start ramping up, and you know we all get excited to uh, go and see some new colorful birds arriving into Colorado. All right, so I'll just jump into it. A little bit of my background. Maybe you saw this, you know, just from my education of where I'm coming from. I started um, getting really excited about birds um, when I lived in Western New York as an undergrad, and uh, and I'll start my talk. Uh, at least on the science end uh, of where I really started as, you know, someone getting excited about ornithology. Uh, and it started like a lot of folks getting uh, interested in science and ornithology with bird banding. Um, that's a younger version of myself on the right here at the picnic table. Um, and I got really excited about, you know, you know, capturing birds, banding them, learning all about their natural history. Um, again, you get to see a lot of exciting birds uh, at bird banding stations. So if you've never done that, I, I strongly recommend it. Um, and that's really how I started learning about birds and the study of birds. Um, this is a, an example here uh, of us banding short-eared owls in, in Western New York, which was really quite exciting for me uh, as a teenager uh, and getting to release that bird here. Um, where we put uh, ra uh, radio telemetry devices on these birds to track their movements in Western New York. And as I started doing my own research as an undergraduate focused on warblers and their vocalizations, specifically nocturnal flight calls. So this is uh, one of my projects as an undergraduate, actually. Um, so I always, you know, encourage folks to get, get interested as, as soon as they can doing things like uh, not just banding birds, but here uh, doing acoustics and learning acoustics from the ornithology standpoint. Uh, here at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology is where we took this photo. Um, and I've bounced around uh, the U.S., you know, chasing birds, doing field positions. Uh, as an undergraduate and graduate student here, I'm holding a Bicknell's thrush 
um, one of the rare thrush species in, in North America um, up in New Hampshire. Um, and as I sort of moved into my graduate studies, I really started focusing on larger scale depictions of the movements of migratory birds. Um, and the transition sort of from field ecology, my background into more remote sensing, which you'll hear a little bit about today, um, was this, this use of radar to study the movements of migratory birds, which was really exciting. Um, and uh, this is, a, you know, the cover of um, the Oklahoma um, newspaper here covering my graduate research, uh, which was a very proud moment at that point. Um, but now uh, here at, uh, in Fort Collins at Colorado State University, um, I get to train a bunch of students now and, you know, uh, share that excitement about birds and migratory birds. Um, so these are just photos uh, from some of the folks in my lab over the last, you know, five or so years of training students uh, on their own field research and very often the use of radar data to quantify the movements of migratory birds. Um, so I usually like to say that, you know, we've got, you know, beautiful habitats in North America to see birds, whether it's, you know, sand dunes um, in California or sand dunes here in Colorado um, to, you know, the furthest reaches into the United States up in Alaska. Uh, there's migratory birds all over. And again, you all are coming predisposed with a, a great interest in birds already, so I don't really have to give my sales pitch per se. Um, but migratory birds are, you know, the, the group of birds that excite me the most. Um, I'm quite an avid photographer as well uh, and love chasing birds around like this rose-breasted grosbeak uh, that just crossed the Gulf of Mexico. I took this photo in Texas um, to, you know, some of these really tiny species that make these amazing flights like the blue-gray gnat catcher. Um, and we get to see these exciting birds coming out of the tropics um, and, you know, delighting us with their colors and plumages. Um, to things like the crane migration that we get both here in Colorado uh, and then here, this photo taken uh, in North Platte in uh, Nebraska. Um, to some of, you know, when I was getting excited about uh, ornithology, hearing about these amazing migrations like the Arctic Tern um, that cover tens of thousands of kilometers on an annual basis for their migration. Um, so again, there's, there's so much diversity and exciting things to see out there. Um, and again, all of you, given this group are, are enjoying that, but if not, and if you haven't already, um, you know, get out, grab a pair of binoculars and, and go bird watching. Uh, it's quite exciting. Um, so I'll start the actual research that we've been doing with, uh, this photo here, and I'll start with this species. So this is a magnolia warbler, one of our wood warblers in North America, a small uh, warbler, you know, often weighing about, you know, 10 to 11 grams, so, so quite small. Um, if you need a reference for sort of that weight, uh, that's about, you know, probably two quarters or so, um, maybe a little less than that, a few dimes, uh, is sort of the, the mass of these birds. Uh, and that amount of mass can take that bird, you know, from the Yucatan Peninsula to cross the Gulf of Mexico and fly into Texas or Louisiana or Florida. Um, and we've been looking at warblers for a long time now. It's sort of a, a pet project in a way uh, in my lab where we've been trying to understand how are these birds, these small, colorful songbirds that migrate long distances, how are they coping with things like climate change? and specifically about their timing of migration. So I'll start there in the talk and then expand a little bit out uh, in, in terms of some of the things that we use for radar. Let's check the chat to see if I'm missing anything. Um, it's all more logistics work. Okay, work good. cool, thanks. <laughs> All right, so I'll start with uh, a study that we published last year on wood warblers actually. So again, bird banding is a common method for us to capture and understand the movement of migratory birds. So it often looks something like this. We put out these fine mesh nets, capture a bird as it transitions during its stopover, uh, will be caught in these nets. You know, it often, you know, starts happy like this. Uh, and then this is me, a much younger version of me extracting uh, an actual, that's a magnolia warbler. 
uh, in my hand there, um, you know, sort of the frustration of getting them out, understanding that puzzle. Uh, and then ultimately we might get the bird out here, uh, different bird species here, but we put these you know, silver bands on their legs that have unique nine digit numbers. And then we release that bird. Uh, and that data itself is, is quite simple. Um, but over many years of doing that, uh, you can amass really important data sets. Um, so this is actually the number of wood warblers that have been banded over the last 60 or so years in North America. Um, and you can see sort of, you know, that we're, we're, st we're banding more birds than we ever have historically, uh, or largely speaking. Um, and across about 60 years, we've banded, you know, just a little bit south of 3 million warblers, uh, 3 million birds um, across spring and fall. Um, and this is for 19 species of warblers. There's more warblers than that in North America, but for our study, we focused on 19 species. Um, so we use data uh, from banding to figure out the timing that these birds were coming through and getting caught in nets and being banded. And we could look at how is that timing of when they're showing up at these banding stations changing? And again, thinking about climate change. Um, so in the spring, and I'll, I'll focus the first part of my talk on spring, given the season we're, we're going into for spring migration, um, at each one of these dots on this uh, North American map is where banding has been going on for at least 10 years. Uh, with some stations, uh, for instance, Powder Mill uh, in Pennsylvania has been banding continuously for over 60 years now. It's one of the longest running stations. Um, so this is, you know, some of the locations that we were focused on of trying to understand bird migration and how it's changing. So here's the breakdown. These are the species we focused on. So on the left, you can see um, where we're you know, using American red star to bay-breasted warbler to black and white warbler and so on and so forth, going left to right on that bottom axis here. Uh, and you can see just here the number of each of those species that have been banded in spring, the lighter gray and darker uh, in fall. Um, so like I said, I'm gonna start with Magnolia warbler just as a case species here. Um, so we can see, you know, across 60 years, around 97,000 uh, magnolia warblers have been banded in spring. Uh, when I started bird banding, I actually started at a field station off the coast of uh, New Hampshire and Massachusetts area. Um, and it's actually right here, this little chain of islands, this uh, island here that's highlighted uh, is known as Appledore Island. Um, and banding here has been going on for around 30 years. And we looked at those data and we said, okay, how is migration changing under things like warmer or cooler spring seasons? And we might make a prediction when it's warmer, for instance, spring happens earlier, the bugs come out earlier, uh, we might predict maybe the birds respond to that. And actually what we see for the magnolia warbler is that when it's warmer in the spring season, the birds are being captured in the nets earlier in the season. Um, so there does seem to be a response just in the timing of migration um, relative to changing temperatures. And again, thinking here as a surrogate for climate change. So again, that was for one location, Appledore Island, for one species. We looked at this for spring across 46 locations and we did it for 19 species. And what I'll just draw your attention to on this plot here uh, with all the species here and these colored dots here, if anything is on the left of that dotted line here, it's telling us that during warmer conditions, um, the birds are actually showing up earlier. Um, and so that's you know sort of interesting to us and compelling that climate change warmer conditions are having an effect on the migration patterns throughout North America, at least with wood warblers. Um, and so we obviously know that a lot more birds migrate than just warblers. Uh, so again, just to get us primed for thinking about migration at these scales is where I wanted to start off today. So of all birds globally, uh, of the 10,000 plus species, about 19% are considered migratory. 
And then we could expand this a little bit of saying, okay, in North America, the number might be a little bit higher um, because we have you know, pretty harsh winters in some areas. So a lot of birds do have to migrate. There's not enough resources to support them through the winter, for instance. So in North America, most birds migrate um, and about 70% of terrestrial species are migratory. Um, and then I would argue, right, the bird banding approach that we took, right, those birds, at least when we catch them, right, they're usually on the ground and they're in their stopover location. So migration effectively, the act of migrating has stopped, at least for that day. Uh, and the birds are foraging. Um, but at night is when the action really happens of migrating. Um, so we could ask the question of all the migratory species in North America, do they migrate at during the day or do they migrate at night? And when we break down those numbers of the birds that migrate, about 80% of our species, all the ones shown on this slide, migrate at night under the cover of darkness. So that presents a number of logistical issues. Uh, how do we actually quantify the movements of these birds as they fly often high up in the atmosphere at night under the cover of darkness? And in my lab, the Aero Eco Lab, Aero Eco being Aero Ecology, the study of the movement of organisms like birds through the lower atmosphere, the aerosphere. So our tool that we use in my lab is radar. Um, specifically, you're probably familiar with these radars. You know it or you don't uh, in terms of knowing that you're familiar with it. Um, we use the system called NEXRAD. So NEXRAD stands for Next Generation Radar. And these radars, the one pictured here is a WSR-88D. So this is Weather Surveillance Radar, engineered in 1988, deployed shortly after that. And all of these are Doppler radars. So again, you might turn on the Weather Channel, uh, and they might say our, you know, our Doppler radar shows us this. Those are the same radars very often that we use to study migratory birds, and the same radars that power the BirdCast interface that you might be familiar with as well. Um, so that's what these radars look like. You probably have seen them maybe driving up and down a throughway. You see these golf ball looking things up on a pedestal. Inside of that is a dish that's spinning and sampling the airspace. Okay, so that's a radar, uh, what it looks like. There's radar sprinkled all across the United States. There's one in Key West, Florida, which I'll show you here. So this is an, an example, the white dot in the middle of the screen here is a radar on, on Key West in Florida. Uh, and it's called KBYX. All our radars have four letter acronyms. Um, and this is for the night of April, uh, mine's covered up here. I think it says April 29th. I can't see it though. Um, later April, let's say, um, uh, in 2023. So what I'm gonna show you is a sequence of radar images at the top of the screen here, uh, these reds, yellows, oranges, greens, and blues up here, this irregular shape at the top of the screen, that's precipitation or rain droplets. But what I want to draw your attention to is look at the stuff where the arrow is, is taking off. These are birds taking off around sunset, leaving the Florida Keys, uh, and they're migrating north given spring migration. And then what you'll see is a secondary wave of birds coming. And those are birds leaving Cuba and making uh, entering into the airspaces of Florida. So this is what this looks like. Those are birds taking off, going through the airspaces. Uh, and again, these aren't a few birds now, and they're not just warblers. They're all the birds that migrate at night. On this night, you know, we, we're likely talking about tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of birds filling the airspaces uh, of Southern Florida. So we could take radar data from Key West, Florida, and we could look at what does that look like across a time series for a spring season? So on the up and down axis, the Y axis here, this is cumulative migration activity. How many birds are passing 
the Key West station. And it's just based on a percent, 0% to 100% of the birds have passed at some point of the season here. Um, and that's what you're seeing uh, on this plot. So this yellow line here is for one year's worth of data for that station. From our perspective, we could take this as a similar measure like we get from bird banding to look at what's the peak timing of migration through this location. And so we could say it's the, the date at which 50% of birds pass through. We might call that peak migration. So again, we have radar data, uh, they're collected, they're freely accessible, and there's a large archive of data like this that we can process for bird migration activity. So when I say there's a large archive, these data go back to the early 90s. Uh, they're collected every five to 10 minutes. Uh, they're collected daily, still today, same network that was designed in 1988 is available, is active. Uh, and we can use it to study the movements of migratory birds at all of these locations across the United States here. So there's 143 radar stations. Uh, and for this study that I'll show you here, we used 24 years of data, 13 million radar scans. And it took, if we ran it just on one computer, would have taken 1.2 years to compute uh, all or process all of our data. We have tools to do that much faster now. Um, so we could take these data, which again, don't represent just 19 species of warblers, but all the birds that migrate at night. And so now we're talking about hundreds of millions to billions of birds being detected instead of the few million birds that we were able to capture with banding data. And so just an analysis, or at least the um, parallel type of uh, analysis we can do with radar. And so the axes are more or less the same as what I just showed you from bird banding, but now these are radar data. And so we might predict, um, in this case, as it gets warmer um, on seasons or spring seasons, when it's warmer, we expect to see the birds showing up earlier in spring. And in fact, when we crunch all of our numbers, that's more or less what we find. Um, and again, we see as it's getting warmer in the spring, the birds are also showing up earlier. And again, maybe over time you get hints of that or you suspect that might be true. Um, the data at the largest scales that we can process them are also suggesting that. So hopefully you can see the connection from how we can build up uh, our understanding from things like bird banding, a classic ornithological approach all the way up to using radar data to study it at US scales. Uh, so we are quite excited um, of seeing these connections here showing up in our radar data as well. So as I mentioned, uh, these are where we have these radars. There's 143 dots on this map here. That's where we have radar installations. And as I mentioned, these birds are migrating under the cover of darkness. And, you know, we depict these maps looking like this, right, as if it's nighttime. But we know the reality of, of what's going on is that the nighttime sky is, is much brighter than it was 50, 100, 200 years ago. Um, every year it gets brighter and brighter as we illuminate more spaces. Uh, and these birds have evolved for hundreds of thousands to millions of years to migrate under the cover of darkness. And now that is changing quite rapidly. Um, so we've been interested in how light pollution, uh, lights at night can affect migratory birds. Um, so this is a photo I took uh, a couple of years ago out at Pawnee National Grassland. Um, you know, it's one of, you know, the best spots uh, to see, you know, things like the Milky Way in Colorado. Um, it's a great vantage point to see an amazing array of stars. But even in a photo like this, we can see, you know, light pollution on the horizon um, from some areas of the front range as well. Um, so light pollution, again, point source, it, it bleeds out into the sky and can have widespread uh, implications for our, our view of the nighttime sky. And we know that things like light pollution can have effects on human health to you know, perceive notions of public safety. Um, in areas like Tucson, for instance, in Arizona, right, they have a large infrastructure around astronomy. So 
light pollution can impact, you know, the science that is being done to study uh, nighttime skies and sort of extraterrestrial type of phenomena. Um, but today I'll focus on the impact of, of light pollution on ecosystems and specifically migratory birds. So just a few examples that are non-bird related, um, just to make sure that, you know, it's clear that lights are impacting um, more than just birds. Um, so this is an example uh, Dr. Carolyn Burt put together a really nice review paper uh, that we worked on last year um, that goes through, you know, a wide array of the impacts of lights on migratory organisms. So here, migratory organisms here being grasshoppers um, that were attracted in the tens of millions into Las Vegas. Um, and we can view this uh, and quantify these movements of nearly 45 million grasshoppers coming into Las Vegas. And we could quantify that using radar as well. Um, we can see that lights are impacting the movements of classically nocturnal species like bats. Um, so we might think of, you know, maybe a roadway fragments a forested patch, right? It's clear that that fragments a contiguous patch of forest, for instance. But for some species, lights at night can actually fragment the atmosphere or the lower atmosphere. Um, and that seems to be true for things like bats, where sometimes they're attracted, but sometimes they avoid illuminated areas and it creates an actual barrier uh, on the landscape in the airspaces. Um, and then one of the studies I've worked on for a while is the uh, impact and the attraction of lights on migratory birds. And one of our classic examples of this is, is work we did uh, a number of years ago in New York City, where we looked at the impact of the September 11th tribute in lights on attracting birds into those light sources. Um, so these are some visuals out of that paper led by Dr. Carolyn Burt uh, that I think really capture, you know, uh, these phenomena of lights and their impact on, you know, a, a wide array of organisms. Um, in the tribute and light example that's depicted here, um, you know, across uh, seven nights of monitoring, we estimated uh, around 1.1 million birds coming in and out of those light sources. So it's, it's quite dramatic, um, the impact that lights can have on migratory birds. So we had these questions, uh, and this will be the study um, that I'll, I'll spend some of my time on here, um, is, you know, we have built up uh, a number of examples of how lights can impact organisms like migratory birds, like the example from the tribute in light, um, but we don't have a, a firm understanding of how it's impacting the movements of birds, their distributions at, the, at a continental scale, at the scale that these birds are actually migrating at. Um, so this is something we focused on last year uh, and just published this at the end in, in December of 2023, we just published this study I'll focus on uh, of trying to understand you know, how are lights impacting the distribution of migratory birds across the United States. Um, so hopefully this schematic will illuminate, um, you know, hopefully no pun intended there, um, how we use radar uh, to actually look at the distribution of migratory birds coming off of the landscape. So as birds migrate through the night, They'll exhaust some of their energy stores and then they have to land. And they land into our terrestrial landscape and they might land in a forested patch. They might land in an urban area, um, but nonetheless, they're gonna use the terrestrial landscape. And they'll forage for a duration of time. It might be a day, it might be multiple days, um, but eventually those birds are gonna lift off around sunset and start a new migration. And as those birds lift off of the landscape, we have radars all across the United States sampling just above those spaces. So as the birds lift off of a forested patch, and if a lot of them lift off, we would be able to detect that det density showing up in our radar samples. So hopefully the schematic, um, in, in, at least in the, in the broadest characterization here, would it would make sense of how we could use radar to map where and when birds are on the landscape. So this 
in big picture would look something like this. We'd take a radar scan. We would usually extract them right around sunset when the birds are lifting off. And we might take it for one night and then we do the same process for the next night and the next night. And then let's say in that night, there was actually precipitation. So we'd have to remove weather contamination and then we'd keep the process going throughout all of spring migration and all of fall migration. So in some nights there would be more birds and some nights there would be fewer birds. Um, so usually a, a season for us is about 90-ish nights, 93 nights usually make up a spring season and 90 nights make up a fall season. And we would aggregate these radar scans and we could calculate how many birds are coming off of the landscape. And this is an example for Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Um, so we've done this process, not just for one radar, in this case, the Oklahoma radar. Uh, we've done it for all 143 radars across the lower 48 for spring and for fall. So on a US scale, that one dot would look something like this. But as I mentioned, we've done it for all of the radars across the US. So if you're looking at this, um, all the gray areas are where we don't have uh, adequate radar sampling. All of the circle areas, we do have good sampling. And then on our color scale, uh, warmer colors, the yellows show us that there are more birds coming off of the landscape and the purple colors, there are fewer birds coming off of the landscape. Uh, and then in some areas, there's sort of these wedges uh, that you don't see on the circular. Uh, it looks like little pie slices have been removed. And those are instances where things like mountains, um, various topography block the radar beam. Um, so we lose some coverage as well in some areas. So what we did is we, we took all of these data and then we link them with predictors, uh, terrestrial predictors. So we might say, okay, we expect more birds to come off of the landscape when there's forest. Given our past research, we might expect more birds to come off the landscape when there's things like light pollution, for instance. So in all, uh, we linked our radar data with 49 predictors. You don't have to you know, look at all of these. I just want you to at least contextualize that we added a lot of information to these radar data. And then we started modeling these data. What we're trying to do is learn the associations all across the US of the linkage between migratory birds and predictors on the landscape, like forest, like water, like greenness. Uh, like light pollution all across the US. We build lots of models, um, this many models here, uh, 2,500 models for fall, 2,500 models for the spring. We assemble those um, just to build confidence that this works. Uh, we can make predictions of uh, the truth versus prediction. Again, this might be getting in the weeds a little bit here. Um, but what we find is that we can make really accurate predictions of where the birds are. Uh, and this would be useful, right? Because in that map, we had incomplete coverage of where the birds were. All the gray areas in those previous maps, we don't have good predictions of migratory birds. But we do have adequate uh, predictors of the landscape. So we could use that to make predictions of how many birds are in those unknown areas. And these plots are just show, showing that we can do this effectively. So we did just that. Uh, this is a contiguous map um, of the stopover density of migratory birds across all of the US. This is for fall here. Um, and this is for one year predicted. Uh, and then we could take those maps. We could zoom into them. They're fairly high resolution. We can see on this map here, the uh, yellows are where more birds are coming off of the landscape. You could probably see some hints of riparian corridors, um, the state boundaries here lighting up. And again, that's because there's river systems there. Some of the yellows are where there's a lot of forest. And this starts to make sense when we look at some of these predictors of developed and agriculture and forested uh, landscapes here in this Midwest region. Um, there's a negative, typically a negative association with agriculture, positive association with forest, uh, but we still don't know the association, at least from these maps, of the association with light pollution. Um, and again, just as a general, another thing that we got from these maps, we can make uh, what we call um, hotspot maps as well. So 
uh, all across the U.S., the areas in red are what we would deem as migratory hotspots. And you could look at Colorado and see some of the Front Range, uh, some of the eastern regions of Colorado lighting up as hotspots. And you can you know, find your favorite area in the U.S. Uh, and see where various hotspots are. And again, this is for fall, and we've made these for spring as well. And we could zoom in to all sorts of areas across the U.S. and try to understand these hotspots. So here in the Pacific Northwest, and we can go to the um, southwest of the U.S., you know, Great Lakes, Midwest region, southeast of the United States, and look at these hotspots. We've made hotspot maps like this for every state in the U.S. Um, so these will go by fast. <laughs> Um, but we have maps like this for all 50, or at least all the lower 48 states um, in the U.S. and the various hotspots. So um, there's a lot of uh, conservation implications for maps like that. Um, but I just want to close on, you know, what were the really important things in our models that were driving where birds are on our U.S. landscape? And so that I'm gonna show that in this plot here, and this is gonna be for spring first, and I'll show you what it looked like in the fall. Um, and so let's just start at the bottom of this plot. I'll walk through this uh, slowly. The mean gain, the details of it don't much matter for our purpose here, um, but what that scale is gonna tell you is how important that variable was at predicting birds on the landscape. And so in this case, grassland or herb uh, herbaceous covers, land cover on the U.S. landscape, was within our top 10 as a most important predictor, but it was neither a very strong or negative predictor. It was important, and in some cases it was positive, in some cases it may have been negative. So we would call it a neutral predictor, and it's shaded as gray. Uh, maybe not uh, unexpected, mixed forest on the landscape, the amount of it was important, and it was positive, so mo more forests, more birds. Again, not uh, earth shattering, hopefully that's obvious. Um, and we did this for a lot of predictors. We can see that things like cultivated crops, the first red bar there is important, uh, but it's a negative predictor. When there's more cultivated crops on the landscape, there are fewer migratory birds on the landscape. And then I'll just uh, show you the last, the top two here, uh, and these were, one of them was quite surprising to us. Uh, and the second most important predictor of migratory bird density across the United States was sky glow or light pollution. And it was consistently a positive predictor. So more lights on the landscape, we saw more birds on the landscape. So that's a little alarming to us as well. So you can see it showing up there. So we did the same thing for... Uh, the fall, uh, same story, more or less, pretty similar takeaways, sky glow, again, showing up as the second most important predictor um, across the United States landscape. When we break down all of the variables, uh, just based on percentages, land cover is still the most important uh, factor driving where birds are, either positive or negatively. Um, but as a single predictor, sky glow was one of the most important. Um, so that's quite alarming to us. Okay, um, so I don't want to end on a, uh, a sort of a sour note of the direction of, you know, changes that are happening across the United States. So we've seen how climate change can be affecting the timing of migration, and we learned insights of that from bird banding, using radar data to quantify the passage of migratory birds, we can see, we can now map where and when all of the birds are um, across the United States. We can identify important areas for stopover, but we also see that it's changing because of light pollution. So we might just ask, you know, what can we do? What tools do we have for action? Um, and as was mentioned, a, a project that I work on and collaborate uh, is known as BirdCast. And this is a collaboration between my institution at Colorado State University, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, and the University of Massachusetts. So BirdCast is run by all three institutions. Um, and, and at that, um, at BirdCast, we host forecasts of, of bird migration. 
Um, so the bird forecasts were created by myself and Dr. Benjamin Van Doren, who's a faculty member at the University of Illinois now. Um, and we can create maps of, of where and when birds will be flying on any given night in spring and fall. And so a map uh, might look like this. Um, actually, I'm going to jump to the, the next map. This one will make more sense, I think, first. So this is a map of, of predicted intensity of migration. This is actually from last year, from May 10, 2023. And this is really at the, the peak of migration. Um, so this is a forecast of where we expect the, the most number of birds to be migrating through the airspaces in the lower 48 states. And on this night, um, we're estimating around, you know, four and a half uh, or 440 so odd million birds migrating through the airspaces. So just tremendous numbers of birds. And with these maps, we create these intensity maps. We also create maps of where we would advocate of turning off lights. Um, and so all the areas in red will have a tremendous number of birds migrating through and turning off and reducing light pollution in those areas would have a really positive impact for helping birds uh, migrate north uh, during the spring and south in the fall. Um, so we also create these lights out alert maps as well. And uh, so this is our uh, forecast uh, for tonight, actually, across the United States. Um, so again, you can see the maps are a lot less colorful. We're at the very beginning of migration. Uh, there's some birds migrating in the southern United States, middle of the U.S. through the Central Flyway, um, but things aren't really heating up just yet. Uh, we'll get there, uh, and these these maps will come up, become alive. Um, and uh, a map like this, which was our, this is our lights out alert. We really don't have any alerts, uh, red alerts um, at this stage uh, on the night of tonight, March 21st, 2024. Um, so you can go to birdcast.info or the aeroecolab.com uh, and you can see these maps, uh, both the intensity, the alerts. Uh, we have a migration dashboard. Uh, that you can see all of the birds that are likely moving through your region, and that's powered by eBird data. Um, so a combination of, of things like radar, um, machine learning AI tools to learn and forecast migration, and then also uh, adding in the species components um, that are powered through eBird. Um, so a nice integration of data um, is living at BirdCast, and you can go there at birdcast.info. Uh, to learn all about bird migration and see what's coming through, you know, hopefully over your house uh, at night and maybe what's landing in your backyard the next day. So with that, I will pause, see if there's any questions, and I truly appreciate uh, the invitation uh, and thanks for your attention. Really appreciate the uh, talk, Dr. Horton. Um... I did have a question, but elevation. Now, how is elevation a predictor? Higher, lower elevation? <laughs> yeah, so um, the elevation in those models is, is likely an artifact of, uh, it's maybe an unfortunate predictor that we had to include there. Um, and it likely comes out as an important predictor because most radars in the US are positioned at high elevations. Um, and what can happen there, and they put them at high elevations, so um, you know, the beam that's coming out of the radar doesn't hit the side of the mountain. Usually it should be higher. Um, so what is happening is that you know the, the radars are positioned high, uh, and then as the birds lift off of the landscape, there's an elevational component that it takes the birds that are further from the radar longer to get up into the radar beam. Um, so it's, it's not necessarily uh, likely a an indication of where birds are relative to elevation, but how birds are getting detected by the radars. Again, it's sort of convoluted, um, but it's, I think we, you know, hindsight 2020, I, I would have corrected for elevation before we modeled things and likely light pollution would have risen to the top predictor. Um, but yeah, just the way we, we modeled it, it showed up that way. I don't know if that helps a little. 
Fantastic. That's very helpful. So, um, yeah. So if you have any other questions out there, uh, just put them in the chat and uh, Dr. Horton will see them or we'll, uh, we'll uh, read them to him. Uh, um, one of the questions in the chat uh, are any agencies, land managers, or other conservation groups express interest in the US-wide predictive models of stopover densities for selecting conservation priority areas yet? Um, yeah, so to some extent, yes. Um, I presented um, these maps to a working group that covers uh, a number of states through the Mississippi Flyway, so about 14 states, uh, the folks that you know, focus on migratory birds in those states. Um, and so if, if delivered uh, the data to them, um, they view it in that way, right, of, of trying to figure out what are the prior, priority areas um, and obvious follow-ups of, of this type of work would be, you know, if there's a hot spot, is it already protected, whether at the local, state, federal level? If not, uh, is there room for protection? Is it needed? Um, so that's one uh, way we've been uh, using those data and communicating them. Uh, another one, we worked with uh, Birds Georgia, uh, formerly uh, Birds Georgia Audubon. Um, and there's been some proposals for some land development through mining. Uh, and we use these stopover maps to say, okay, this area is a really important area for stopover for migratory birds. Um, the mining's right in the heart of one of these important stopover areas. So for trying for to give them information to advocate um, for uh, halting or maybe modifying that development. Um, so they're starting to get used in, in some of these contexts. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, another question, what can we do to educate our HOAs, communities, cities about the importance of turning off lights? Are there marketing materials to send to people? Um, yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, light pollution is a, is a challenging topic. Um, it's challenging in the sense of we have maybe some um, preconceived notions of what, you know, that lights are good for us at night. Uh, makes us feel safer uh, as we're walking around. Um, there's really mixed evidence that it, you know, conveys safety for us. Again, we feel the way we feel um, when it's illuminated, um, but there's not much information to suggest that it, it changes that ultimately. Um, so I think, you know, trying to frame it um, of saying, you know, we can reduce the intensity of light, right? Maybe folks aren't willing to turn off the lights, but we could reduce the intensity of the light, um, when there's street lights in our towns, communities, um, if there's a chance for a retrofit of having shielded light, right? We don't need to be lighting up the uh, atmosphere. We, we want lights where we want uh, to be walking through, right? So if we could shield the lights and direct them towards where we need the lights or want the lights, that can go a long way. Um, and then just the color of light can matter too. So uh, the bluer lights that maybe we're, we're growing more familiar with. Again, uh, often the gripe is when we're, we're driving up and down the road and you see those cars with the really, really intense lights um, that are really blue. Uh, those type of lights tend to be, um, that color of light is worse for most wildlife. It causes stronger attraction. Um, it's more disorienting. So the warmer the color of light, the better. So that the warmer meaning um, more yellow to orange colored lights um, are softer uh, and they uh, have a, a weaker attractive effect on most wildlife. Uh, so those are some of the things that we can try to message around. And for in terms of information marketing materials, um, groups like National Audubon have great materials. Uh, the International Dark Sky Association or IDA um, has really good information for um, you know, brochures, leaflets um, uh, to hand out as well. So yeah, if, if you need any of that, please let me know. Um, let's see. Yeah, can you provide a simple explanation of how you're able to separate the weather contamination from the birds and the radar data? This has always intrigued me when looking at bird cast maps. Um, yeah, so... Uh, there's a few different steps that we take. Um, the radars in the U.S. were upgraded 
uh, in 2013 to what is called a dual polarization. Um, the details of that, <laughs> we don't need to get into here, um, but what that allowed us, it, it provided a new data product, a series of data products that allow us very easily to filter out rain droplets. Um, and so we can identify rain very easily and then birds show up differently in some of those new products. So it's almost that we have a threshold of saying anything above this value is weather, precipitation, anything below this value is gonna be classified as birds. So uh, when you look at the forecasts, um, those uh, don't necessarily have, you know, they're trained on clean data, but in some of our real time maps, that type of filtering is going on in real time. As soon as the radar come in, uh, every five and 10 minutes, they get processed. And one of the first steps in that processing is to remove the weather contamination, the precipitation, maintain just the birds, and then uh, process those data and start to visualize them on bird cast. Uh, and if there's too much contamination like that in those real time maps uh, that my colleague, Dr. Adrian Doctor processes at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, um, he'll just say that, you know, we don't feel comfortable showing the data because it's too contaminated. So there's some levels uh, in that processing. Hopefully that helps a little, Megan. <clears throat> Um, let's see, there's a question here. You mentioned that more birds are detected migrating where there is more light pollution. Why is this necessarily bad? Could some species be taking advantage of light pollution? How do you assess the differential impacts in different species? There is some evidence that some birds prefer light pollution. For example, communal roosts of grackles in lighted parking lots in Texas. Um, yeah, so there's a, a bunch of things going on there. Um, for most migratory birds, light pollution does tend to be bad. Um, I didn't show it, uh, a video I took a number of years ago at the September 11th, uh, Tribute and Light, um, has this really dramatic impact of showing what's going on. The birds uh, get attracted to the lights, um, and it's, it's almost the same scenario where you have a porch light on and a moth just keeps circling around and around and around the light. Um, and that moth eventually gets exhausted and, and drops down to the, the concrete or the porch or the deck or whatever it is. Um, the same thing happens with a lot of birds where they'll circle and call and circle and call um, and they can't escape the attractive effect. So they come in high, they circle and they circle and they keep getting closer to the ground. And in some cases, what happens is they start colliding with things as well. So colliding with buildings, um, at communication towers, they uh, collide with the guy wires of the towers, and that causes mortality or broken wings. Um, so there's a bunch of negative consequences in flight for light pollution. Um, and then in some cases, you know, when these birds should be stopping over in a forest, they're getting pulled into an urban area. Um, and so that can have negative consequences too. Um, and there's, you know, it, it could be that they're stopping in suboptimal areas in the city or during the day, maybe they're more apt to collide with windows or be predated upon by cats, for instance, right? So there's a bunch of uh, follow-up consequences um, that extend into migration. Um, but you're certainly right that that, like, for instance, the grackles in Texas, right? You go to a gas station and you hear the cacophony of, of, you know, grackles surrounding those areas. Um, and so some of that's, you know, roosting phenomena might be warmer, it might be safer, there might be less predators when these birds are in these large communal roosts. Um, but often those are sort of different phenomena going on uh, than our general passage migrants. So hopefully that, that helps a little bit. Again, I'm happy to follow up if there's there's pushback on my responses. I know it's a sort of one way. <laughs> um, we appreciate appreciate your uh, your your sharing this with us tonight, uh, Dr. Horton. This has been a fantastic program.